Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Uh, Mr. Mark Donfreit, director and founder of the ICD. Uh, His Excellency Mr. Frank Mueller, uh, member of parliament and deputy chairman of the ASEAN Parliamentary Group. Uh, distinguished Professor Shamsul Amri Baharudin, he's the one who's supposed to be standing here and giving you a lecture, not me. Uh, but let me uh, start by saying uh, how thankful we are to the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy for being very generous to host uh, this event uh, this afternoon. Uh, this is actually uh, the first program under our own cultural diplomacy program. We have just started and this is the first one and I'm proud to say that we choose Germany to be to, to kick start our our diplomacy, I mean cultural diplomacy program. <laughs> so someone asked me the other day why Germany? I say yeah because we want Germany to be the World Cup champion <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there are countries in our region who have started uh, cultural diplomacy a long time before. Uh, Indonesia is a good example. I think they started in 2003. My colleague from Thailand uh, will tell you that uh, they have started uh, quite, uh, if not about that time, probably earlier. I wouldn't say that we have not done anything at all on cultural diplomacy, but to formalize it under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, we have now just started. Uh, I must congratulate the Institute for recruiting so many uh, young students from all over the world, and not that I am uh, normally uh, like to mention states or nation states who are represented in the room, but for obvious reason, I'm very happy to see Afghanistan girls in the room. It goes a long way as uh, your contribution to <coughs> what is happening, uh, to, to the reconstruction. I think in the positive spirit, we are talking about the reconstruction of Afghanistan, uh, the will, the world that we, the world that we want, to many of us who share some kind of idealism, is probably not really the world that we are living in today. We would like to have a world that is really peaceful, that is really harmonious, where people share the uh, the wealth of the world, the world that operates based on certain values like truth, justice, uh, equity, uh, uh, with full respect of the law, uh, environmentally sustainable, and so on and so forth. Of course, countries that has uh, a working democracy and democracy that produces the democratic goods that we dream of having. A country that practice, or countries or world that practice social justice. Uh, Malaysia believes in a multipolar world uh, where uh, we know the contestation between the five superpowers and we have always been very open about supporting the role of the countries in the EU, including Germany, because we simply need to balance uh, the contestation or the competition between the five superpowers. We face, as I was just saying, we face uh, clusters of problems, including the behaviors of the superpowers, and also contemporary issues. I call it contemporary developmental issues. Number one is climate change. Perhaps it is better to say climate crisis that are man-made. Yeah. If it is natural, it is not a crisis. It is a crisis because it is man-made. 
we celebrate the advent of technology which is bringing a lot of benefits to humankind but it has its own downsides like issues on cyber security uh, the spread of hate speech on the internet and so on and so forth and we also face the international architectures in finance and economic and politics and so on and so forth which can be biased to certain sides of the globe and not very beneficial to certain side of the globe so the challenge is finding the solution and i believe this is part of the thing that you discuss in your classes i do not want to go into that area i am simply saying that uh, we want to learn from Germany, we want to learn from the Institute on what are the kind of things that we need to do, particularly on cultural diplomacy. I agree with you, uh, cultural diplomacy encompasses uh, uh, a big uh, spectrum uh, from, uh, you know, things that we normally, some people talk about, the arts, the performing arts, the music, the movies, to high culture, to the thoughts, the thinking, not just the thinking, it's the thoughts, yeah? Um, the philosophy, uh, the identity, uh, the actual uh, ethos of uh, each societies. And we bring with us today uh, one of our distinguished professors, we don't have so many of them, there's only three distinguished professors in Malaysia. One of them is Professor Shamsul, a well-known scholar, uh, one of those, uh, one of the top advisors to the government when it comes to uh, issues on unity and social cohesion. So, thank you so much for coming. I look forward to listening to Professor Shamsul's lecture and to a fruitful dialogue uh, thereafter. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs of Malaysia, Mr. Dato Sri Saifuddin Abdullah. Thank you so much for the honor of having come here today, traveled all the way from Malaysia, uh, given an excellent welcome address uh, to prepare for the very excellent professor uh, who gave the keynote address. We would love to have a chance now multilaterally to ask you a few questions, and really ranging all around the world uh, to try to gain uh, also more from your expertise. Um, I'd like to begin with a topic which is in the media every day when you open the internet, uh, something that unfortunately doesn't seem to be improving, although we're hearing mixed things in the media. What is your opinion about the current situation in Ukraine? Do you see the current situation in Ukraine as a Russian proxy war, some have referred to it as? What is your advice to the heads of Western countries in this regard? What is your advice to the Ukrainian president? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, nobody wants this war, and this is something that we don't need. Uh, Malaysia is a small country and far away from uh, Ukraine or Russia, but we are already feeling the pinch. Uh, inflation happens every now and then, but we also know why uh, inflation is happening today. Uh, we are a net importer of food, but we are facing more challenges today because we have problems in the supply chain. Uh, we have 800 students uh, in Russia, and the parents are now concerned that uh, if this conflict will go on uh, for we don't know when it will end, they may have problems sending money uh, to Russia, to their uh, kids because uh, of the system, because of the embargo and so on and so forth. Now, we believe that no one can go and attack or do any kind of aggression into a sovereign state. So what Russia is doing in Ukraine is definitely not worthy of any support. And we have voted like, likewise uh, in all of the United Nations uh, resolutions. But at the same time, we also understand that this is part and parcel of the behaviors of superpowers. The five superpowers uh, have certain habits and certain behaviors. Some like to go to war, some don't like to go to war, some do certain things in a certain way. 
So I wouldn't say that this is simply the war between the West and Russia, but this is really um, something that happened due to the contestation, the unhealthy competition, uh, which form the habits and the behaviors of the superpowers. Now, my message to the Ukrainian uh, president is we understand the sorrows and we empathize with him and the people of Ukraine. But at the same time, we must also be truthful to ourselves that other than Russia and Ukraine, people must come together to get the two leaders to sit down and try to end the war. We need to stop the war as quickly as possible. You know, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. That's right, that's right. Um, essentially. So now moving on to another tension that's growing globally, it's between China and the West. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming more and more visible daily. So what is the position of Malaysia on this issue? And how do you personally think that the international community can resolve the tension that China is now experiencing? Well, if the, United, if the UN Security Council works in the real sense of the word, then probably we don't have this tension. But because the UN Security Council is not uh, working uh, as we aspire it to work, so we have this tension. But beyond that, as a small country again, and ASEAN as a whole, is trapped between two big elephants. So we are like the mouse deer <laughs> between the two elephants. Now, the biggest issue here is everyone, including the US and China, wants to have a say on South China Sea. That is the crux of the matter. Now, Malaysia believes and we uphold the principles under the UNCLOS, uh, free navigation and free overflight. And we want uh, South China Sea and the region to be a region of peace and a region of prosperity where everyone can come and trade. Uh, we, I used to say that there are the three T's. You know? One is trade, uh, the second T is technology. By all means, let's compete in trade and in technology. What we don't want is the third T, that is the threat. And the threat can come from many, many ways. Uh, a few years ago, uh, there was one incident where two battleships, one from the US and one from China, were just 100 meters apart. Now, for people who understand uh, how uh, the Navy or uh, how things happen or works uh, in the open uh, ocean, they will understand that even though it is 100 meters, like it's so far apart for ordinary people like us, but two big battleships, 100 meters apart, is like almost colliding. Mm -hmm. Luckily, nothing happened. Yeah? So we have always made this call to both uh, the the, the US and China that please uh, we do not want to escalate matters we do not want to create tension uh, we want uh, everybody to honor the fact that this sea belongs to everybody and every time uh, we have this uh, unhealthy competition then it will be the small countries uh, that will suffer now, Malaysia believes in a multipolar world. And it is in this context that every time I meet up with my colleagues from the EU, then I will be repeating the same call, that we would love to see the EU playing some kind of role uh, in the affairs of the region, not because of anything else, but to balance this unhealthy competition or the contestation between, never mind if you say it is the West versus China, but I think it's between US and China. We would love to see uh, an active, and the EU is one of ASEAN dialogue partner, mm -hmm. and we, we put a lot of importance uh, to, to the fact that the EU is uh, one of the important uh, dialogue partners in ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I'd like to come back to cultural diplomacy for a moment. Mm -hmm. You made clear in your statements earlier, cultural diplomacy is very important for you, which is great. How important is cultural diplomacy for Malaysia, do you think, uh, in terms of the overall country? Are there really benefits? Will this have a positive impact on Malaysia? As you also pointed out, this isn't, didn't start today. Uh, and actually, in many ways, Malaysia has been practicing cultural diplomacy for a long time. Maybe mm -hmm. it wasn't called cultural diplomacy. Maybe there wasn't a cultural diplomacy department. Mm -hmm. So I'd love it if you could give maybe one or two examples. Uh, if you look at the different religions, the different cultures, the multiculturalism as a whole of mm -hmm. Malaysia, mm -hmm. one or two examples where you say, okay, here, cultural diplomacy worked. Here, it had an impact. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, when I talk about cultural diplomacy, uh, we, official, we officially uh, launched this project in December last year. But as you correctly said, that uh, it doesn't mean that we have never done cultural diplomacy before. Uh, perhaps it was even conducted by our ministry, uh, but not as something that is very uh, systematically organized. Uh, I'm sure the Ministry in Charge of Tourism and Culture has organized uh, numerous programs which can be categorized as cultural diplomacy. And in the past, we have also been involved uh, in some of the conflict resolution work in the region, particularly in the southern of the Philippines and the southern of Thai, uh, southern of Thailand. Now, but why, why the need for us to formalize this work? I think it is for a couple of reasons. Number one, in today's world, when many systems seem to fail, I'm referring to the political architecture, uh, international security architecture, international finance and trade architecture. Uh, I think uh, this is where uh, cultural diplomacy would probably play a more important role than it was before. And we are learning from experiences of our neighbors, uh, Thailand, Indonesia. Uh, nearer, uh, further a bit would be South Korea. Yeah. And of course, Germany. Uh, we have seen how some of your organizations have been working uh, in Malaysia and in the region, uh, in the area of education, in the area of uh, democracy and freedom and uh, civic mindedness and things like that. So, uh, we feel that it is about time that we systematically uh, plan our cultural diplomacy program uh, and this will include uh, a whole spectrum of things uh, from the performing arts uh, like songs and movies, music, uh, dance, to food, the culinary, uh, to textile and things like that. But also equally important, or for some people this is even more important, is the sharing of ideas uh, in the area of academic, in the area of thoughts, uh, in the area of research. And this should also include sports, for example. And we know that this is very useful. Uh, I remember <laughs> this uh, earlier on, I was talking about the example of the uh, South Korean president uh, when he spoke at the UNGA uh, last year. Part of his speech was, you know, given to the seven young men uh, of BTS, the K-pop. And uh, the last three minutes of the K-pop presentation was a video showing them uh, dancing in the hall. Obviously, it was recorded earlier, but that's cultural diplomacy at work. And how many Europeans uh, know South Korea, but they buy Samsung handphone, uh, not because they know that the technology is uh, better than uh, the other handphones or the other brands, but because they thought, ah, this is a, a Korean uh, product, must be cool. How do they know Korea? If they are young men, they probably know uh, Blackpink. If they are young women, they probably know uh, K-pop. Uh, sorry, uh, BTS. Yeah. yeah. So that's cultural diplomacy in motion. And Qatar is using sports diplomacy to the full. Um, there is a book. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the author, but he is teaching in, I think, Georgetown University in Doha. Uh, the title of the book is 
Qatar, small country, big politics. And he talks about how Qatar wants to play a role in international affairs, and they are playing a role in international affairs in trying to uh, negotiate uh, what is now happening in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, and one of the tools that the Qatar government is using is sports. Uh, they were hosting all kinds of sports events, and this year, everyone is looking at Qatar because they are hosting the World Cup. So branching off of cultural diplomacy and more towards nation branding, we do know that most recently Malaysia has ran a very successful campaign called Malaysia Truly Asia. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel that this particular campaign was so successful? And using that, what are your tips for countries who are trying to run similar nation branding campaigns in order to help them improve their tourism and their foreign investments? The Malaysia Truly Asia uh, motto or tagline uh, would not work if the people of Malaysia doesn't leave the cultures of Asia. You just can't brand it. Yeah? You can only brand it because the product is there. So it suits our country, it suits our identity because we are multiracial, we are multicultural, we are multi-religious. Uh, the main religions of the world are all there in Malaysia. We have the main, uh, what they call, uh, ethnic groups of Asia, the Malays, the Chinese and the Indians, they are all in Malaysia. So yes, uh, we are uh, practicing an Asian culture and because of that, uh, that tagline works. The current government is using Keluarga Malaysia, uh, translated into English will mean uh, the Malaysian family. And again, uh, the Malaysian family is about uh, people of different backgrounds. Uh, so we celebrate multiculturalism uh, in the real sense of the word. And when it comes to cultural diplomacy, we would like to park it. I mean, if there is such thing as parking uh, cultural diplomacy within the discourse that we understand as multilateralism. Uh, the other way of looking at it, and something that we also talk about uh, in Malaysia, is about peaceful coexistence. The fact that uh, all these major religions and major ethnic groups can work, can live together peacefully and harmoniously. You see, in 1957, when we achieved independence, not many people give Malaysia a chance because we have all the religions and all the big ethnic groups. This was a recipe for disaster, but we, we managed. And I think we're very proud of that. And I think this is something that we want to share with the rest of the world while we also learn. I mean, we learn about your 1989 big event of unification, uh, something that was very historical, not only for the people of German, as I understand it, it is so for the whole world. I mean, it's a huge step forward. And that would not happen. Okay, maybe it could ha happen because a few leaders decided to break down the wall. If the people were not receptive to the idea, they may not rebuild the wall, but they will, they will build artificial walls that would further uh, you know, make uh, uh, them, uh, you know, uh, separated. Yeah. No, it's true, and I've spoken to many also East and West Berliners, and when the wall came down, that was, of course, an important step. But the psychological wall uh, was still there for many, mm. and that took, actually, in some cases, generations and decades. Mm. So it's a very important point. And I appreciated your reflections also on nation branding. As you said, cultural diplomacy, on the one hand, used to be unilateral. Uh, if I'm French, I want to tell you about French culture, and I want to bring you French language. But now it's uh, about sharing. Then it became bilateral, which is, yes. of course, more interesting, with academic exchange, etc., going on 
both directions. As you pointed out, what I find the most effective and most interesting is what the European Union is doing multilateral. Exactly. Uh, let's bring the borders down. Let's make it easier for exchange. Let's exactly. make it easier for these kinds of things. So exactly. I definitely see that's the way it's evolving. Mm -hmm. I want to come back with the final question to nation branding. And in this case, maybe give you a chance to do some nation branding. I want to ask you three questions. Uh, <laughs> and in your answers, hopefully you will attract us all to, to come immediately to Malaysia. First of all, what can Malaysia offer young people who would like to visit and live in Malaysia? Secondly, what can Malaysia offer to foreign investors if they're thinking of investing in Malaysia? And thirdly, what can Malaysia offer to the world? Wow, this is probably the toughest three questions. <laughs> but the most important. <laughs> Very important. Yeah. What can Malaysia offer to young people who would like to visit and live in Malaysia? Malaysia is an open society that embraces different cultures. Diversity to us is a strength, it's a source of strength. It's not a sign of weakness and a sign of a problem. So we are a very open society that can accept people from all over the world. So please, uh, we would welcome people. We already have thousands of students from probably more than 100 countries studying in Malaysia. And we would love to host more uh, students uh, to come to Malaysia. What can Malaysia offer to foreign investors? I think if there is one word that can represent Malaysia is stability. You know, in 2018, for the first time ever, we have a change of government in the real sense of the word. A different party, an opposition coalition took over the government. No, nobody went to the streets. Nobody go to the streets. 22 months later, there was another change of government. Nobody go to the streets. 17 months later, another government was formed. Nobody went to the street. I think Malaysia celebrate, cherish, and put a lot of premium on this word, stability. So stability is something that we can more or less guarantee to foreign investors. What can Malaysia offer to the world? Peaceful coexistence as a concept. I know uh, I have been uh, reminded that peaceful coexistence is a term that was used during the Cold War. Uh, it originated from mm, this part of the world, but uh, our peaceful coexistence is something else. Uh, this is about knowing the other, celebrating the other, and to be able to live together in peace and harmony with the other uh, as a family. Uh, like your brother, like your sister. And this is something we feel we have done quite well. Yes, we do have our pockets of problems here and there, but on the whole, as I said, in 1957, when we achieved independence, no one gave us a chance, but we are here now, and we are still, uh, well, uh, doing quite well. And perhaps this is something that we can offer to the world. No, thank you very much for those messages, and I think the, the answers you just gave to those questions, one could consider having as maybe the core of those cultural diplomacy programs that you're in the process of building. So as I said, if we can be helpful in any way, I'm happy to have dialogue with you, with the embassy. I think it's an exciting moment for Malaysia. Uh, we appreciate your initiatives in December to, to get this going, and we very much look forward to seeing how it all evolves. But thank well, you again. I look forward to working with you in this area. Wonderful. Thank you again very much for the honor of having come today. It was an excellent event. And thank you. And also for the interview. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.